Welcome to New Life Assembly of God Media Ministry. We are glad that you are here. We believe the Word of God is relevant and life-changing, and we hope you can be blessed by this message. If you'll take your scriptures in hand and turn with me to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the verses in that passage as we move through the message, uh, but we're continuing our series tonight, The Voice, and tonight's message is titled, What God's Voice Sounds Like, What God's Voice Sounds Like. There was a man in Australia that was arrested for stealing sheep, but he emphatically claimed that it was his own sheep that had been missing for many days, and he had gone out searching for it and found it. So as he testified in court and his attorney argued his case, the judge was perplexed. The judge didn't know what to decide, and finally he asked that the sheep be brought into the courtroom as a witness. Then he ordered the plaintiff to step outside and call the animal. The sheep made no response except to raise its head and look frightened. The judge then instructed the defendant who had been accused of stealing the sheep but protested that it was his own sheep, he ordered him to go out into the courtyard and call the sheep. And so when the accused man began to, began to make the distinctive call, the sheep bounded towards him running out the door. And it was obvious to the judge and to everyone in the courtroom that the man was indeed telling the truth because the sheep recognized the familiar voice of his master. Amen. Tonight we're going to continue our series, The Voice, as we talk about hearing God's voice. And last week we looked in John 10, or in our previous message, we looked in John 10, where Jesus three times said, My sheep hear my voice, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. And if you missed that message, I encourage you to go back online and watch it. But God is speaking to us all the time. And we need to be able to discern his voice. I've been asked many times through the years, how do you know when God is speaking to you? And we're going to go through a description of God's voice to give you some of the identifying marks so that you will be able to say, this is God. Or you'll be able to discern and say, no, that's just my heart or my thoughts or that's another voice that's speaking to me. But before we talk about what God's voice sounds like, we want to talk about what God's voice does not sound like. There are three common misconceptions about the voice of God that we see reflected in 1 Kings chapter 19. But the background to what takes place in chapter 19 is to understand what happened in 1 Kings 18. Elijah challenged 850 prophets of Baal and other false gods at Mount Carmel to uh, present sacrifices to their gods. And he would offer a sacrifice unto Yahweh, the one true God of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And whichever God answered by fire, that would be the true God. Make everybody thirsty tonight. Whichever God answered by fire, that would be the one true God, and all of Israel would worship him. So the prophets of Baal prepared their sacrifices, put it on the altar, and from morning till evening, they shouted, and they danced around the sacrifice, and they called upon their gods to send fire, and absolutely nothing happened. When it was Elijah's turn, he built an altar, he put the sacrifice on it, and then he doused it with so much water that there was even a trench filled with water surrounding the altar. And then Elijah prayed a short and simple prayer and called on God to send fire from heaven. He said, oh Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, oh Lord, are God. And boom, the Lord sent fire from heaven. It burnt up the sacrifice on the altar. In fact, the fire was so intense that it burnt up the stones and it licked up all of the water. And Elijah had all 850 false prophets executed. But that did not make everyone happy. Wicked Queen Jeze, Jezebel, who was an idol worshiper and who had brought these prophets into the land of Israel, found out about what Elijah had done, and she sent a message to him threatening to kill him within 24 hours. So Elijah, facing a death sentence, 
takes off running. He runs almost 17 miles into the wilderness. And in 1 Kings 19, 9, it says, There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And this is what we're talking about, isn't it? The Lord said to him. We're talking about hearing the voice of the Lord. And Elijah's experience teaches us some very important lessons about hearing God's voice. First of all, God speaks to us in our need in the way that we need. He speaks to us in our need in the way that we need. God often speak, speaks to us in our weakness. Coming down from an incredible victory, a mountaintop experience where, you know, God sends fire from heaven and, 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 and proves uh, that he is the one true God. And then he prays and God restores rain after three and a half years of dry. It was an incredible spiritual victory. But, you know, when you have a spiritual victory, the enemy is always going to be waiting to attack you. Because often your defenses are down when you've experienced victory. And so Jezebel is angry that Elisha has killed her false prophets. And she issues this, this death threat to kill him within 24 hours. And Elisha, this great man of God that just called fire down from heaven and prayed rain after three and a half years of drought, he is gripped by fear. And he flees for his life. And then when he runs into the wilderness, before he gets to the cave, he throws himself under a tree and he wants to die. He's telling God, just kill me now. I can't go on. And, and, and God sends an angel that cooks for him. I'm still waiting for that angel to show up at my house. Sends an angel to cook for him and feed him. And then uh, he gets to sleep. And then he wakes up again. The angel prepares him another meal, lets him sleep some more. Because sometimes, you know, we are weak when we are physically not nourished and when we're physically not well rested. And God knows that we need those things in our life amen and so that oftentimes those things can lead to depression just like how Elisha was depressed in that moment so God ministers to him physically uh, allowing him to eat allowing him to rest etc and then he after his rest after he's eaten he runs for 40 days and he ends up hiding in a cave on, in Mount Horeb. He's feeling all alone, isolated, and extremely discouraged. And Elijah is saying, God, I don't know what to do. I'm the only one left that has remained faithful to you. I feel so alone. And in the cave, when the quiet had calmed his soul, the Lord spoke to him. And sometimes it takes our circumstances causing us to feel the depth of our weakness and need to bring us to a place to be able to hear what God wants to say to us. Oftentimes when we are riding high in spiritual victory, our soul is not in a disposition to hear from God. We might not even be seeking in those times to hear from God. Because life is good, everything is going our way, and we feel we've got it all under control. It is often in our weakness that God speaks to us. And God will speak to us in the way that we need. In 1 first, uh, first Kings 19, verse 12, it says, God spoke to Elijah in the sound of a gentle whisper. Or some versions say, a still small voice. At Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, God spoke to Moses and Israel, not in a still small voice, but in a loud thunderous voice to impress on them a holy fear, a holy reverence for him. Because that's what they needed at that time. But he speaks to Elijah, not in a thunderous voice, but in a gentle whisper. In this moment, Elijah was broken and discouraged. He didn't need a booming, thunderous voice. In his fragile condition, that probably would have overwhelmed him. What he needed 
was a tender, comforting voice that would communicate the gentle assurance of God's presence. So God spoke to him in his weakness in the way that Elijah needed to hear God's voice. As parents, you can probably identify because you have your reprimanding voice that you use for your kids when they have done something wrong or you're telling them to do something and they're not listening. And you have a particular tone of voice. My mother had a tone of voice and we knew once she used that tone of voice, if we didn't straighten up and fly right, we knew what was coming next, amen? Because even though my parents weren't believers at that time, they did follow the scripture where it says, spare the rod and spoil the child. (laughs) That scripture they had down pat. So we knew what was coming next once mom started using that reprimanding voice. And and I know the parents here, you have your own reprimanding voice. But you also have a comforting voice when your kids are hurting or when they're fearful. And you determine which voice to use depending upon their need, upon the purpose of the moment. And God does likewise. So don't compare yourself to how God is speaking to someone else or has spoken to other people and think that because God didn't speak to you that way, God is not speaking at all. Sometimes we miss the voice of God because we are comparing ourselves to how someone else has heard God speak to them. God will speak to each one of us individually and uniquely according to our need. And God can speak in any way that he chooses. For Balaam, a stubborn, rebellious, false prophet, God had to use a donkey to run him off the road. And then finally, he used the donkey to speak to Balaam. Because Balaam really needed to know, hey, you're being a real dummy. And I'm going to even use this donkey to tell you (laughs) what you're doing. So God can speak in any way he chooses. He's never spoken to me through a donkey. (laughs) But you know what? He speaks to me. So I can't compare myself to how he spoke to Balaam and say, because he didn't do that. He's not speaking to me. Are you following? I know that's kind of a ludicrous illustration, but I hope it gets the point across. Just because God doesn't speak to you the way he spoke to somebody else doesn't mean that he is not speaking. Amen? God can speak in any way that he chooses, and he chooses the way that we need at the moment that we need it, at the moment that we need it, all right? Secondly, God sometimes speaks in the spectacular, but most often God speaks in the simple. Read with me, if you will, 1 Kings 19, verses 11 and 12. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, The Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So often we're looking for God to speak to us in spectacular ways. But most of the time, God speaks to us in very simple, nondescript ways. It says, after the fire was the sound of a gentle whisper. And most often God speaks to us in a gentle whisper that we hear in the depths of our soul. Not a booming, audible voice, but a gentle whisper in our soul. But too often we miss God speaking to us because we're looking for God to speak to us in the spectacular. We expect there to be a mighty wind or or the ground to shake or a loud voice to come from heaven. And God may speak in that way sometimes. Ezekiel described the voice of God as rushing waters. In Revelation 1.15, John said, his voice thundered 
like mighty ocean waves. At Mount Sinai, God answered Moses with thunder. And God's voice is also described in scripture like the sound of a trumpet. And we listen to that and we say, man. I would love to hear God's voice like that, a mighty thunder, a trumpet sound. Then I would know for sure that it was God speaking. But when God spoke with the sound of a trumpet and thunder at Mount Sinai, the people were filled with fear and they begged God to stop speaking to them. And they said, Moses, you go up on the mountain and you hear from God, and you come back and tell us what God has to say. God's intent on Mount Sinai was to instill in the hearts of his people the fear of the Lord, not to make them afraid of him, but to instill in their hearts the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? It is an awesome reverence for him as the one true God. He didn't want them to be afraid of him. He wanted them to reverence him, to honor him, to worship him, and to walk in his ways. Sometimes God's voice is a booming, thunderous voice bringing a strong rebuke, like the voice that Saul heard on the road to Damascus when he was knocked to the ground and he heard God's voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and that voice caused him and all those that were with him to fall to the ground. Sometimes God speaks in spectacular ways. But his voice always matches the purpose of his message. God does not always speak to us in dramatic and sensational ways. In fact, God sometimes, most times, speaks without an audible voice or sound. Instead, it is a whisper in our soul, an inner impression, a prompting in our spirit, a dream, a vision. And most often, God speaks in a gentle whisper. The way that Elijah experienced the voice of God is, is the way that God most commonly speaks to his people. Sometimes we mistake what God is saying to us as just a passing thought because it was such a gentle whisper. And, 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 and we might think, wow, where did that thought come from? Why did that suddenly come to me? A few days ago, I was at home and I was, since I've had some time off, I've been trying to organize my house and do some cleaning and getting rid of some stuff and what have you. And so I was in the process of doing that. And I just heard in my spirit the song, You Are My Hiding Place. And I hadn't heard that song or sang that song in a long time. And I said, you know what? I'm going to pull that up on my uh, uh, Prime Music app and, and I'm going to listen to that. And as it was playing, I received a disturbing phone call that really is about someone in my family and it just really grieved and burdened my heart. But there was that song playing as I was talking on the phone saying, you are my hiding place. You know, that was just a whisper. And when that whisper came, I said, why am I thinking about that song? But you know what? I'm going to play it. I'm going to put it on. And I believe that that was God preparing me for that call and to let me know that he is my hiding place. Amen. So don't dismiss those gentle whispers that come like a thought out of nowhere. I believe that we need to, to be trained to recognize his gentle whisper or we can miss the fact that God is speaking to us. I believe that God is talking to us a whole lot more than we are hearing. Because either we are not listening or we just don't know how to recognize his voice. And, and too often there is so much noise or distraction in our lives so that it drowns out the gentle whisper of God. 
And although God can get our attention in dramatic ways if he chooses with a booming, thunderous voice, he would rather that we listen of our own choosing by stilling ourselves in times of prayer, worship, and reading his word to hear from him. Notice God spoke to Ezekiel, in, uh, it, it, God spoke to Elijah, excuse me, in the quietness and solitude of the cave when he was there by himself. We need times of solitude in our life. We need times to pull away from the noise and the distractions of the world and other people and spend time in God's presence. We need to set aside time regularly to disconnect from the noise and distractions of the world. And I believe that this is one of the biggest reasons that we are not hearing God's voice. Because we're listening to everybody else's voice on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. Uh, the average American spending four to six hours a day on social media. And then we're like, why isn't God speaking to me? But we have so many other voices, so much other noise, so much distractions that we don't take that time to hear from God. We need to quiet ourselves in his presence to hear from him. And, and, and too often, even when we do set aside some time for God, we rush into his presence, we unburden our soul of whatever is troubling us, we present our list of needs, we say amen, and then we rush out and go on our way. And God is there like, but I had something to say. <laughs> but we never stop to listen. I encourage you to read his word, pray, worship, and then still yourself to listen. And have a journal nearby and write down what you sense God is saying to you. I have a journal right by my chair where I often pray and read the word. And I write down in there things that God impresses on me while I'm praying or while I'm reading his word. So just write it down. And it was, it's amazing because sometimes I, I find an old journal and I go back and I read it and I'm like, wow, God, I see what you meant. That came to pass or that happened. And so it's a confirmation to see how God was speaking in those times. Whatever God speaks to you, write it down, pray over it, and ask for confirmation because he will confirm it. Third principle, God wants us to hear and understand what he's saying to us. Read with me again verses 11 and 12. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Three things happened before Elijah heard the Lord. There was a strong wind, there was a big earthquake, and then there was a ferocious fire. And God was not in any of these. After all these things, God spoke in a still, small voice. Now these three things that happened, these three occurrences that happened before he heard God's voice represent three common misconceptions about the voice of the Lord. First of all, the wind represents the misconception that God speaks to us in mysterious ways that we really can't recognize or understand. You remember in John 3, 8, when Nicodemus came to Jesus uh, to talk to him by night and Jesus began to talk to him about uh, the, the need to be born again and, and Nicodemus couldn't understand how a fully grown person could enter again into their mother's womb to be born again. It was difficult for Nicodemus to understand because he was thinking on a natural level and Jesus was speaking on a spiritual level. But in verse 8 of John, uh, that chapter, Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So Jesus makes a correlation between the, the wind and an element of mystery in how God works in our lives, particularly bringing someone to salvation. 
With the wind, you can hear it, but you can't see it. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. You can't predict it. The implication is that we cannot understand or explain the working of the Spirit. There's an element of mystery to the way the Holy Spirit works in our life. And so because of that, some people think the voice of the Lord is mysterious. Years ago, I was invited by someone in the church. It was actually in the early years of the church, some 30 years ago, I was invited to the home of someone in our church, and they introduced me to a friend there, one of their friends, who called himself Prophet Jimmy. He even had business cards with the name Prophet Jimmy. Whenever anyone gives themselves a title like prophet or apostle, that right away is, you know, like a red flag for me. So uh, he, he called himself Prophet Jimmy, introduced himself at Prophet Jimmy, handed me a card that said Prophet Jimmy on it. And then after he had introduced himself and handed me the card, he started to shake like this. A and he said to his wife, quick, quick, get the notepad. And then he started to prophesy over me. And he said something like this, God is going to use you to preach the gospel to many people. Hello, I'm a preacher. <laughs> Didn't take God to reveal that. But, but, but he had this whole sense of, uh, of mystery, you know, his whole body was shaking, you know, and, and his voice got all deep and rattly in it. We have this misconception that the voice of the Lord is mysterious and that only a select few people hear it. We, we feel almost like God is speaking, but he doesn't want to be found. Maybe you have thought that God is in the wind, that he makes it very mysterious and hard for us to hear from him. But in 1 Kings 19 11, it says the Lord was not in the wind. Hearing God's voice is not something mysterious, unknowable, or unrecognizable. God is not trying to make it difficult for us to hear his voice. The reason he's speaking is because he wants us to hear him. He wants you to hear his voice so that you can understand what he's saying to you. He is not trying to be mysterious or hard to find. He wants us to hear and discern his voice. He wants us to recognize it and be very clear about it. So God was not in the wind. God does not speak mysteriously. Secondly, the earthquake represents the misconception that when God speaks, there's going to be some kind of strong physical manifestation. When there's an earthquake, everybody feels it, everybody sees it, right? A lot of people mistakenly think that when God speaks, there's always going to be some kind of powerful physical shaking or manifestation. Some people even look for a certain physical sensation in their body, which may or may not happen. If it's there, it is our human response to his supernatural presence. Theologians speak about the difference between the noumena and the phenomena. The noumena from the Greek word pneuma, which means spirit. The noumena speaks of the activity of the spirit. Phenomena speaks of our response to the activity of the spirit. So the noumena is what the spirit is doing. The phenomena is what we can observe as a human response to the working of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit is working, some people may cry. When the Holy Spirit's working, some people may tremble. When the Holy Spirit's working, some people may fall. When the Holy Spirit's working, some people may become extremely still in his presence. That's the phenomena. That is their response. So for instance... If you were to grab a live electrical wire, you're going to have a response. Some people may yell and scream. Some people may fall on the ground. Your yelling and screaming or your falling on the ground is not electricity. It is the response to electricity. Are you following me? All right. So the physical demonstration of quaking or crying or whatever may or may not be present when God speaks to you. That's why we're told in Romans 12, 6 to prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, not according to the proportion of our feelings or our experience. God wants us to get to the point where we 
uh, operate in faith. Emotions operate in the realm of our soul, but faith operates in the realm of the spirit. God wants us to get to the place where we are hearing his voice based on faith, not because of some manifestation, some feeling, or some experience. Amen? 1 Kings 19.11 says the Lord was not in the earthquake either. If we're looking for the same feeling or the same manifestation each time or, or some big demonstration of God's power, we may just miss God altogether. Now, in time past, God spoke in an earthquake, right? When he came down on Mount Sinai, the entire mountain shook. But God does not always speak in the same way. And often when God speaks, there is no dramatic physical manifestation. And so if we're looking for that feeling or we're looking for that manifestation, we may just miss God. All I'm trying to say is don't sit around waiting for some kind of dramatic outward manifestation in order to validate that it is God speaking to you. Because God is speaking. God does want to speak to you. And many times when he speaks, it will be a gentle whisper. We will not experience anything physical. There will not be any dramatic manifestation. It will be a gentle whisper in our soul. Then thirdly, the fire represents the misconception that when God speaks, he comes to proclaim judgment. Because fire in the Bible is often associated with judgment. God is described as a consuming fire who brings judgment upon the wicked. And some people are afraid of prophecy because they're afraid that the Lord is going to speak judgment or, or address issues of sin in their life. And one of the reasons we do that is because when we read through the Old Testament, a lot of the prophets were proclaiming judgment, even though the message of judgment was almost always followed by a message of hope and re redemption if they would repent. But the reason that the Old Testament prophets prophesied so much judgment is because of who they were speaking to. Sometimes they were speaking to heathen, idolatrous nations like Moab, Edom, or Nineveh. Or sometimes they were speaking to Israel or Judah in a backslidden, rebellious state. And so there was a warning of judgment in order to call them to repentance. But to the church in the New Testament, Paul says that the purpose of prophecy is primarily to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. One of the challenges in raising up a prophetic people is to teach them that when God speaks, he's not speaking in judgment He's not speaking doom and damnation. He's not speaking criticism. That is less evident that they are hearing from God and probably more evident that the person has a spirit of condemnation and a spirit of criticism, and that's why they're speaking judgment. It's not coming from God. It's coming from the flesh. Now, there are times when God may speak a corrective word to us, but the point I'm trying to make is that most of the time when the Lord speaks to us, like it says in Romans 2, 4, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. God comes speaking good things to us, even if the message is a message of repentance. So God was not in the fire. God's voice does not always bring judgment. In fact, most of the time, God's voice comes to comfort, to strengthen, to encourage, to call and to guide. After the wind, after the earthquake, and after the fire, then God spoke in a gentle whisper. If you don't listen for it, you will not hear it. You know, I think that is why the Lord tells us often in Scripture to get up early and pray, early will I seek thee, the Bible says. I don't think it's because there's anything more anointed about the early hours. It's simply that before we start the hustle and bustle of our everyday life is when there is sufficient quietness in our life to be able to listen for that gentle whisper. His voice is not like a mighty wind. It's not mysterious or hard to perceive. His voice is not like a powerful earthquake where you're going to feel some dramatic outward manifestation. And his voice is not like fire 
where God is going to come in some uh, judgmental or corrective form of condemnation. Most of the time, God is just speaking to us in a gentle whisper to share his heart with us, to tell us his will for our life, to guide us. And his whisper comes and goes so gently that you're almost not even sure if you heard it. It's so soft and subtle. So let us learn to wait upon God and make space in our life where we are disconnected from the noise and distractions of the world so that we can hear his voice. Make space in your life and then lean in to listen. Wait upon God. Pay attention to those soft whispers that just come like a fleeting thought into your soul. God is speaking. Let's not miss what he's saying. So tonight as we close this message, let's make a commitment to make space in our life where we disconnect from the noise and distractions of the world and we lean in to hear his voice. And let's say, Lord, teach me to listen. If that's your heart, just speak that in prayer to the Lord right now. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now and we are so very grateful that you're a God who reveals himself, that you're a God who is continually speaking to us, making yourself and making your will and your way known to us. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to hear your voice. And Father, I pray that every single one of us would make a commitment tonight to make space in our life where we disconnect from the noise and distractions of this world and we quiet ourselves and we put ourselves in a posture where we lean in in stillness to listen for your voice. Teach us to listen so that we recognize those gentle whispers that come almost as a fleeting thought through our soul and that we do not dismiss them, Lord, but that we pay attention to what you are saying. Teach us, Lord, to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you. We love you. We will see you on Sunday. Thank you for joining us today. If you were blessed by this message, would you consider giving a gift to help support our ministry? You can text any amount to 844-723-4904. That's 844-723-4904. Thank you, and we hope you'll join us again.